and theologically sound and historically accurate every week. Maybe I am asking too much. Probably way too much. I mean, Pastor did visit Joe in the hospital and celebrated with us when Michelle was born and was there when Susan lost her mom and encouraged me to fight for my family when we were on the brink of separation. Now that I think about it, Pastor's been like a counselor, a mentor, and a friend when I needed it the most. Pastors are awesome. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor. Tell that story again. I'll even laugh this time. Okay, so I did not pick that video. Uh, I just want to be clear about that. I agree with it, but I didn't pick it. Uh, actually, that's the first time I saw that. Jessica, our ministry assistant, uh, picks the videos now, so um, praise the Lord. Uh, yes, David. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. It's a, ble- it's a pleasure and honor uh, to be here, always. And uh, it is a blessing to be your pastor. Thank you, Brother Andrew. I am excited about, about what God has in store for us every time we gather. Sometimes it's more exciting than others in comparison, but it's always exciting. Let's stand this morning as we read out of Revelation 2, chapter 1 through 7. I mean, uh, verses 1 through 7. Some of you panicked. You thought we were going to read seven chapters this morning. (laughs) Chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 reads, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Father, may your word speak through your spirit and and illuminate to us. And we pray, Father, that we will be uh, obedient to the word you gave to Ephesus, Jesus, and to the application it has for us in this church today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Standing in the honor of God's word is a beautiful thing, to me anyway. It, uh, it is important that we understand the geographical area that we're talking about today. So if you'll open up in your uh, bulletin, if you, pick, if you received a bulletin. By the way, if you didn't receive a bulletin, know that if you come in the side doors, they are out there at the tables. But if you ever don't receive a bulletin and you'd like one, let us know. We'll be glad to get you one. Our deacons or ushers will be glad to help you out there. Or I'll be glad to get you one if, uh, if I'm not up here. Holler at me and I'll go get you one. Uh, I'll get you one if I am up here, and I'll just make you wait, everybody. Uh, whatever works for you. But on that map, you'll see lined out in blue the, uh, are the churches that uh, the letters that are represented, or the churches that are represented here in the book of Revelation. Uh, on the screen, and obviously you can't see it on the screen very well because it's so little. That's why it's in your bulletin, even though it's hard maybe to read there too. But if you look in your bulletin and kind of reference it to the screen here, You'll see that about here is the Isle of Patmos. So this is where John would have been exiled. And that's off to the bottom left of the west down here, north of Crete and east of Greece. And then you go straight, uh, just about northeast, and you see Ephesus, and then you're Smyrna, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamon, Philadelphia, Laodicea. You're in that whole general area. So it would make sense geographically that the first letter within the revelation that was given was given to Ephesus, as that would have been the very first delivery point from the island of Patmos. So that's important just to understand, and I I want you to get this. I don't think we do this enough. 
I want you to be able to understand the geographic region of these biblical times. They are still there. They just are under different names in the modern day, many of them. Uh, and, and some of them are not there in the sense of cities like Ephesus, for example. But some of these areas that we talk about are, in fact, there. They're just under different names, like Turkey and, uh, and Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and uh, Syria and so on and so forth. So just keep an eye on that as we go because it's important that you see. And as you study, you see this uh, uh, map and understand the geographic location of that part of the world there and how it relates to us today. Now, in uh, the app on your phone, if you have the app, and you're listening online or you're listening live stream and you want to look at the app, the notes are in the app as is the map in the app. So you can get the map in the app also. All right? Sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. But you can get it there. Now, let's talk about a few different things here. And I have laid these out for you in your bulletin notes. And you have seven blanks, which means I'm going to give you some things in these seven blanks. But chances are you're not going to have enough space to write all this down because I just couldn't give all of that space, a lot all that space. But what, well, I'm going to give you some major key points that I think you need to know as you study all of the churches, seven churches or all of the seven letters. So this is the pattern of Ephesus, or the letter to Ephesus. And actually screens and notes, well your notes won't be affected, screens, it's going to be off when we get down there and I'll tell you when we get there. And that's my fault, I gave the wrong order to Jessica um, to, to put the screens together and realized it. This morning, so as I was just going through it again. So, uh, but the greeting starts off in verse two a, verse two one a. So the first part, number one in your notes, is the greeting. The greeting, and that's simply who is this written to, so that we can understand who it's written to. Why is that important, Chester? Why, why take time to say who the greeting is written to? Is it necessary? Well, yes, it is because this letter. Now, hear me very carefully, so you don't get confused. This letter is not written to Smith Street Baptist Church. And I know some of you are like, what? The Bible's written to us. The Bible is God's letter to the people, but it is not His individual letter to you. You have to understand how God wants you to apply those principles within the 66 books of the, of the Bible. So in this case, before you freak out and call me a heretic... We do have modern day application to pull from the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. But this time period where he was writing to, he was writing to the angel, which was the messenger, uh, which is the one who would deliver the message to uh, the Ephesians. Now, last week, the last couple weeks in the introduction to Revelation, I kind of laid out that messenger, and we'll see this over and over again, messenger or angel come from the same Greek word. So what we get is that it may be the messenger, may not be an actual angelic being, it may just be the messenger, the person to deliver this message to the churches. It may be the person who is reading it to the congregation or the gathering of, of saints. And so whatever the case may be, and it really doesn't matter whether you have this vision of an actual angel or whether you have the vision of a messenger or a preacher or a speaker, that's not important. What's important is that you recognize what God is saying in that or what specifically Jesus was saying through this vision to John. So whatever you want to imagine there or vision visualize there, it's okay. But I want you to understand that it was written to the one who would deliver the message to Ephesians, or the church of Ephesus, not to Smith Street. Now, we'll come back to that at the end for the application. But just keep in mind, for the next little bit, you're going to get kind of a history lesson here. The second thing that's important here that we get out of verse 2-1-B, the second part of 2-1, is that he says this. He says it's the description of Christ. The description of Christ, and it's based on Revelation 1. Why is that important? Well, when we go back to Revelation 1, which we've done the last two weeks, and we've read those verses out of the first part, there's a description of who is this is the messenger. So you've got the messenger, the person who's going to receive the message, the angel, the person who's receiving it. But you also have the person, remember if you went back two weeks ago, you would recall if you were here, you recall that I came down and gave you the communication plan so that it came from God through the, his son, through the, which is the messenger, who's going to give it to the angel, who is the messenger, I don't get confused here, who's then going to pass it on through the churches. So, in this case, Revelation 2, 1, second half of verse 1, gives us a description of Jesus Christ. And this is important, because you have got to, as you study Revelation, know who they're talking about. 
different parts of this. If you think one, have you ever read a book and you were reading a book and as you, any book, and as you were reading it, somebody was saying something and the author may have not been very clear on who was saying it. And so you had to go back or maybe you just got confused and you had to go back and look at that and say, wait a minute, who was talking here? Well, if you do, if you're not careful in Revelation, that'll happen. You'll get very confused. And in fact, everything in my Bible from the time in verse 17, chapter one, where Jesus says, don't be afraid for a long time here is written in red. Because it's considered the words of Christ. If you have a red letter Bible, yours would say that. Or yours would show that too. So this is the description that he gives him, gives Jesus as according to Revelation 1. It is him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So in other words, the verse says this. 2.1b says, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands says, this. All right, so that's your description of Revelation. Now there's the next part of this, uh, of the, the pattern here that we see is, number three is the commendation, commendation. Make sure you don't put condemnation. That's coming, but put now commendation. In other words, a commend, he's commending them for something. Good job, you've done something well. So let's look at verse two and read chapter two, two through three. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name, and you have not grown weary. So what he's saying here is good job. Good job, church. You have done well in these things. In fact, it's interesting because here Jesus says, I know, he starts off that verse, David, I know your works. I know your works. He says, I know your labor. In other words, he's saying, you are doing good. All right, now remember I told you that was not written to Smith Street Baptist Church, but now let's do a little overlay. Let's lay Smith Street Baptist Church on top of, or underneath, however you want to do it, on on the scripture that discusses Ephesus. And let's ask ourselves, could, if he were to write a letter to us specifically, to the church of Smithsonian's, or whatever we are, would he say, I am, or know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil? Now, would he say that? Well, most churches would say, I hope he says that about our church. Because wouldn't it be bad if he said, if you asked that question, and you could say, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe we do tolerate evil. Maybe we don't do good works. Can I just tell you something? Just in case you're curious about good works, you don't go to heaven for doing good works. Amen? You can do good works all day long, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you die, you go to hell. That's the plain, simple truth of Scripture. But good works, I believe, no matter what anybody tells you out there, good works will come as evidence in the life of the believer. Now, there are people out there on this uh, kick right now that will tell you that that's not the case. Okay, Uh, I'm not going to get into all that today. I'm just going to tell you what my scripture teaches and what Jesus made a point to talk about when he wrote Ephesus or spoke to Ephesus. And that is that there was evidence of good works. James gets kind of clear on that when he says faith without works is dead. He means if you have faith but no good works, in other words, show me a man who has faith but no good works and I'll show you a man who probably doesn't have faith. Given, people like to say, what about the thief on the cross? Well, he didn't have very long to do good works, did he? But even then there was might have been some evidence, at least if nothing else, of faith and trust, right? So, you know, I say that because I want to to clarify something to you. You could be a Christian and you could sit there in your home and if the only change that you have in your life is that you want to do better, you are truly convicted about the way you've been doing something and you want to model the example Christ has given you in your life. If that's the only conviction you have and you die, I would say that that's evidence. It may not be exterior evidence that the rest of us can see, but if that's truly how you change from the point where you didn't care what you did to the point where now it mattered what you did, and you called salvation as that bridge from that one old man to that one new man, then I would argue, yes, if that's really happening in your life, then yes, the, then you, you probably really are saved. The problem we make here is we compare our lives, our walk with Christ, we compare it to other people. And when you start comparing, let me tell you something, there is no person on God's earth ever or ever will be other than Jesus Christ that we should look to as a measuring stick. 
Okay? We should not. Now, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because he was out there doing the work where everybody was seeing it. He was called to that mission field as a missionary. I may say, imitate me as I imitate Christ, because I'm the pastor of the church, leading the church, but you'll never hear me say, imitate me as I don't imitate Christ. But I could say that, couldn't I? Because I'm not perfect, right? So when you see me mess up, you should know that's not what you should do. You should say, oh, well, now Chester just did this, so I should not do that because Christ would not do that. I can remember he's flesh. He's, he, I'm going to give him grace because I can remember that, that there's a battle. He's not perfect. He's under the same blood of Jesus that I'm under. But at the same time, the, the problem here is instead of measuring Galatians 1.10, which says we are slaves to Christ, not man. So we should be, we should be uh, interested, I guess, in, in, in pleasing him, not man's world or man's uh, um, pleasures or man's objectives or man's desires or man's goals or man's influence or whatever you want to put there. We should be interested in pleasing Jesus. It, it sums it up. Go back to the mid-90s. You can sum it up like this. What would Jesus do? That's the answer. If Jesus would do it, then that's what we should do. If Jesus would do it, that's what we should do. Well, I can't do what Jesus did. I'm not Jesus. No, but you've got him in you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, so therefore you can be successful in that. Okay? We've got to quit making excuses. I started out the year... This year using the hashtag no excuses 2017 with my men's group that met on my discipleship men's group that met every Sunday. I told them no excuses 2017. Then one day I said, guys, I'm not really feeling good. I don't know if we should meet tonight this morning. And they said, no excuses 2017. (laughs) It'd be real careful what you put out there. It'll come back and get you. So imagine for a moment, Jesus writes to Smithstreet and he says, hey, guys on Smithstreet. I'm proud of you. Good job. You stand up and you... Look, I'm going to tell you something. You guys may not realize this, but this church, the church leadership, is very, 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 very careful when it comes to this part right here. Verse 3. Because of my... uh, Let me see. I'm sorry. Verse 2. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You have found them to be liars. Let me tell you something. We are very careful about who teaches and preaches at Smith Street Baptist Church. Now, you may not notice that. You may not know that. But it's very easy. I told somebody one time, I said, this pulpit is not mine. This pulpit belongs to God, but I'm in charge of protecting it and making sure that those who speak out of it are not speaking heresy or improper doctrine. And if they are, I need to correct it. I asked the question in our, in our New Beginnings class for new members. Uh, we wrapped it up this morning. And in that class, I asked the question, I posed the question, how are we as a church... Locally, this, this church, how are we at accountability? Because that was one of the points that they made in the book that we read. And the per, one of the people in the class said, well, you know, we're probably good one-on-one with real individual relationships, but not as a whole are we good on accountability. And I thought, well, that's an interesting perspective because I would have said we're good, but that's because... I feel like I'm the principal, and when you have to come to my office, everybody always makes this joke that they thought they were in trouble. What do you think of me? <laughs> hey, come to my office after church. And they're like, oh, you done it now. Ooh, you in trouble. No, I don't do that. That's not how it is. That's just where I like to sit down if we're going to talk. I have a nice big chair in there. It's comfortable. And I have an air conditioner and a fan and, I just, and a fridge, and I'm good in there. You know? But in, 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 it's important to, to ask yourself right here, would God, would Jesus say, good job not letting people get in the pulpit Good that aren't preaching the truth. If you're sitting under a Sunday school teacher and your Sunday school teacher is preaching something that's false, you have a responsibility to, if nothing else, go. You should be able to question that person the right way. But we have a chain that you can go to Brother David and say, David, I got some theo- theological questions. You come to me, I got some questions. Now, if you come to me and you say you don't like the way your Sunday school teacher's teaching, guess what I'm going to say? Go to your Sunday school teacher. That's why people don't complain to me anymore. Because I just redirect you. Because that's what the Bible teaches, isn't it? Hello? I'm not sure if you hear me or not. Is this on? Is that what the Bible teaches or not? Yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. All right, I was making sure. Thought maybe you had a different translation than I did. And we got to do these things. And, and, and we got to remember that we want to live a certain way that honors God, right? I mean, I do. And he says, you can't tolerate wicked men. Can I just tell you something? The world today teaches us tells us Christians that we're supposed to tolerate wickedness, doesn't it? Well, don't mention abortion. They might be offended. Well, it offends me that we've killed 50 million babies since Roe v. Wade. Amen. Amen. That offends me. It offends me that when I look at my little baby girl, 
tuck her in, pray with her. When she's crying or she's laughing, and I think to myself, there was a woman. You, you think I'm making this up? There was a woman, a, a so-called supposedly Christian organ player of a church that told me when we found out Ava might have a problem with her heart, uh, there was a marker in her heart that might show, might, might indicate Down syndrome. This woman said to me, and I quote, if she has Down syndrome, you might want to terminate the pregnancy. And I just kind of looked at her like, what? And she said, you don't realize how hard it is for that child or for y'all. I just couldn't believe that. My wife and I, we prayed and we, didn't, we went to Augusta and we had the test, the, the, the sonograms done, but we didn't even want to do the other test. I forget what it's called, but it was some test that could result in abort, aborting the baby. It could, call, it could kill the baby. There was a chance, like a, I don't know, 35, 45% chance that it could go wrong and kill the baby. And, and, and we were like, no, whatever happens, happens, but we are not putting the baby in danger like that. If the baby comes out with Down syndrome, it comes out with Down syndrome. You know, I'm just, it it bothers me that we will argue theology about whether somebody will go to heaven or won't go to heaven because whether God predestined them or didn't predestine them. But what we won't do is stand up and scream about the babies being aborted legally in this country every day. You don't have to tolerate wickedness. You don't have to tolerate wickedness. Would you stop? Would you stop, church? Being weak in a day where we are called to be strong. Now, does that mean you should go burn down abortion clinics? No. Does that mean you should go judge those who've been through that? No. Does that mean you should be mean to those and hate them and point your finger and call them names? No. You should do what Jesus would do. You should love them. You should walk alongside of them. You should support ministries like Rachel's House that gives them options of adoption or other options and educates them so that they know what options are available. Many of these children who are being aborted are being aborted because of convenience or fear. People like to throw out, what about rape and what about incest and what about that? What about the statistics for those that are so small that it's not even worth arguing about when we got a big number that's doing it for convenience sake? Well, I don't want my parents to know, or I don't want the community to know, or I just don't want to have babies. You think I'm getting off on a tangent? I'm not. I'm telling you right as God is my witness, that is wicked. And we should not tolerate wickedness. We sit in our little holy huddles. We pretend that... I mean, we, we, you know, our, not this church, God bless it, but our churches. Get in fights about color of the carpet when these issues are going on around us. I want to walk into those churches and say, are you really, are you really that concerned about this? About whether or not the aesthetics looks good in your church so that you can have yourself a happy holy Sunday when people are being killed out there, babies are being killed that can't speak for themselves? If I told you, I've been through these seminars, folks. I've sat, I don't just speak out of my uh, shoe here. I've been through these seminars where I've watched and witnessed the pictures and the stuff that they do. And I'm not going to go into it now, but I'm going to tell you right here as God is my witness. If you sit through one of those seminars and you see the truth, you would be so disgusted and appalled that you would be as, as, as vehemently passionate as I am right now. And maybe you should. Maybe we should get up on Sunday morning and put some of the most graphic images from behind the closed doors of our legal system. The legal options that are available out there. And yet, I'll say this and get off of it. If a man kills a pregnant woman, he goes to jail for double homicide. Go figure, huh? They're either babies or they're not. You can't have it both ways. And I'm going to tell you something. The lost, the left, they're not fighting for those babies. If we're going to remain silent, those unborn children will continue to die. I forget what the statistics are now, but there's a pretty good sized number of babies have died in the last Five, ten minutes since I started talking about it. We need to be on our knees 
We need to be standing with picket signs. We need to be funding other options. We need to be doing something about the tragedy in the United States. This is the United States of America. That ought to really weigh heavy on you. Because if God were to come down right now, Jesus were to write us a personal letter, would he be able to say that you don't tolerate wickedness? I dare say to the church at large, he would not be able to say that today. He would not be able to say that to the church at large. Maybe to you individual, but you're, hey, you're part of the church. I'm part of the church. We got to do more. Amen? All right, let's feel good about ourselves now. Come on. Let's get some, uh, get some prosperity gospel preaching now so we can feel good, okay? All right? Because now, now we all feel bad. Like, and that was the, hey, listen, that was the commendation part, too. Now we're getting into the condemnation. Woo! Get ready. You're fixing to really get it now. All right. So verses 2, 4 through 5, first part of 5, says this. It says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. There's another little bit of example there for works as a result of your salvation. So what's he saying? Well, basically he's saying this. You Ephesians have forsaken your first love. Now, some have interpreted that as a love for God or a love for Jesus. Some have been, in more modern day interpreters have interpreted that as maybe a love for each other. It really is okay for you to interpret that as both. Because here at Mystery Baptist Church, we're about what? Loving God, loving people, right? And then making disciples. But the first two points are loving God, loving people. And we get that from the great command where God says, or the great commandment where Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He's not only saying that here in the New Testament, he's quoting Deuteronomy. So he's making a point that the law comes through him and it is fulfilled by him. And yet we still must obey this part of it, not out of obedience to the law, but out of the fact that we are in a right relationship with Jesus Christ And we want to obey the Father because of our love for Him and His grace in giving us the gift of salvation through faith. So we need to remember that our job, our role, if you will, now, because we are, it's it's like, let me back up and say this. If you go to work with the idea that you have to work so you have to get paid, I mean, you have to work because you want to get paid, your job performance is going to suffer compared to that if you were going to work to do the job because you loved it. Okay, I think we can all agree we've all had those jobs where we thanked God we were getting paid because we wouldn't have done it for free. Now, I can promise you right now, while I thank God that this is my primary, number one vocational responsibility, I was doing this back when I was making $10,000, $11,000 a year. So I want you to understand that God put a desire in me to do this. So I get to get up and most days I don't go to work. Most days I get to go have a great time at whatever it is that God has for me that day within what you would consider my job or vocation. Well, the same comes out when we look at serving God. If we serve God out of some legalistic old view of having to do certain things and check off certain things and yada, 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 the mistake that we make in that is that eventually it becomes work and we don't want to do it anymore because we have to do it. So we got to reset our focus and put it on a get-to mentality. I get to get up this morning and go worship Jesus. I get to go share God with others. I get to go to work and be a light in the dark world for the kingdom because I'm an ambassador for the king. You get to go to your job. You get to go to the store. You might say, I hate going to the store. Find a way to make it a get-to kind of thing. You may have to pray really hard about that. I don't know. But there's a get-to in there somewhere if your focus is on Jesus. In other words, Ephesus had forgotten what got them going. And the church today, if you want to lay Smith Street or maybe the whole universal church on top of Ephesus... The church today has forgotten what got them going. That moment of salvation where you said, yes, Lord, I am excited. I I don't know anything about the Bible except that it's your word. And I don't even know what that means, but I'm trusting in Jesus and I'm going to be baptized. And my life is going to be different. Praise God. Yes, that moment where you remember that feeling. Because we've forgotten it. As your pastor, who tries to be as transparent as humanly possible and acceptable, 
I'll tell you this. I have regular times with Jesus where I have to go, help me, God, remember the get to. When somebody puts me down, lies about me, hurts my feelings, cusses me out, says something mean about me, or says they're coming to church and then they don't for 25 years or whatever you know people do, and, 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 and that devil starts getting in there reminding me of all the stuff that's not going the way I want it to go and not happening the way I want it to happen, and maybe it's even the way God would will it for if people would just be obedient, but it's not happening that way, the devil gets down and he starts tearing me down. You know, sometimes i got to go spend some time with God and say, God, remind me about the get-to. Remind me that I get to do this. Because I'm going to tell you something, I don't have to do this. That's what God reminds me. My wife reminds me of that sometimes. You don't have to do that. You get to do that. And then I start thinking about all the get-tos that I enjoy about doing ministry. I got to deliver the rest of our supplies to three different locations last week that were left over from the hurricanes. I got to take baby supplies over to Rachel's house. I got to drop off adult diapers over at Community Hospice. Right, Miss Sue? I got to see you. I got to see you. I got to take... I did something else, and I can't even remember what I got to do. But I got to take something else somewhere. It's going to bother me now, but oh well. I got to. And as I left, and I would walk up, and I would say, Hey, I've got these things that are left over from when we had the shelter. They're not doing us any good. We wanted somebody to have them. So here, here's, here they are for your, your, your ministry. And, and the people would just light up. And I'm going to tell you something. I got to do that. That was a get to. I get to study the word. I get to preach a sermon. I get to listen to you when you're hurt and celebrate when you're happy. Do you get to? Well, if you've forgotten your first love, you may feel like you're stuck in a have to. But I encourage you like he was encouraging Ephesus. Replace your have-tos with your get-tos. How do you do that? Well, the exhortation is the next part. Verse 2b. The exhortation. In other words, he's saying simply this. Repent. Repent. Oh, I'm sorry. This is where I got you backwards. Yes, this is where I got you backwards. The warning should be next. I thought I changed it and then I didn't. The warning is next. Why should I do this? Why should I go back to my first love? Because of first, f- verse 2, 5b. Repent and do the things you did at first. Repent. No, that is the... No, I got it. I got. Uh, good Lord, help me, Jesus. Number five is exhortation. I had it right in my notes that threw me off on the screen even though I said it was going to be backwards. So go down one more to number six. Six is going to be... Six, the other way. Six is going to really be five in your notes, okay? Exhortation. Okay, that's number five in your notes. Sorry about that. Number five in your notes is exhortation. Now, exhortation is he's just giving you some advice here. He's telling you how to do it. He's encouraging you. He's saying, listen, you need to repent and do the things you did at first. The way he loved you. The way we loved him at first. That's pretty self-explanatory. Repent and do the things you did at first. Repent does not mean go get saved again, although some people misunderstand that. It means confess that to God. Hey, I'm not doing the things I need to do, and I need to turn around and go and do the things I need to do. Help me, Lord, do the things I need to do. Whatever that looks like, however that plays out in your life, you've got the ability to make me do that, Lord. Make me, help me, walk me, give me grace. I know you're continuing to give me grace because when I was messing up, you didn't throw me into the fire. So help me, Lord. Help me walk through that. And then the next one is the warning. 2-5-C. This is the warning. This is number 6 in your notes. The warning is that to the local body of Ephesians or Ephesus is that he will remove the lampstand from its place. Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, uh, does not exist anymore today. Some scholars, modern day scholars, have said that that's because they did not repent the way they needed to. I don't know. That's between them and God. I can't tell you whether they did or didn't, but they don't exist. But what he's saying is, This is how I word this. I say this a lot. If God's hand is on a ministry, it means just fancy way of saying God is involved in a ministry. If God is involved in Smith Street Baptist Church and God's hand is in this, okay, and he is present and working through the believers here at Smith Street, and the believers don't obey his way of doing things, he will remove, I believe, you can disagree, he'll remove his blessings from it. He'll still be present in the body of believers. The Holy Spirit is still present within the believer. But you've got to... 
You've got to obey Christ and His desire to let, that, to let that manifest out into you or out through you into the area around you, the world or whatever, through your, through your works and through your actions and through your good deeds. And through your, so if you're not obeying God in that, sometimes churches will say, well, it just doesn't feel like God's here anymore. Well, in the sense of doing the works through His people, if the people aren't obeying and doing the works, then guess what? Technically, He's not. He is and He isn't. It's not that He's gone anywhere. It's not that He's disappeared. It's not that He's completely... Absent, but there's no life there. There's nothing going on for the kingdom there. He's not working through the people because the people aren't obedient there. So we got to go back to the get-tos. we got to go back to our first love. And the promise in 2.7b, and this is the last one here, number 7, the promise is this. For those, look at this, let's read this together. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. In other words, if God is doing this in your life, you are really a Christian, you will be in the paradise, in in heaven. You will have eternal life. So we must, believers, we must go back to that first love. We must go back to that time of excitement. And sometimes we have to fall in love all over again. I, I have never fallen out of love with Heather. But I continue to fall in love with her more than I did originally. If she says, do you love me more than you did when we got married? Absolutely. That's how it should be with Christ. You know what the difference is though? I say this and we'll wrap it up. The difference is this. I know her better now than I did when we got married. The better I know her, the more I love her. The better I know Christ, the more I love Him. Now there are good guys out there preaching that, that, is, that there is no level of getting to know Him better. It's just once you're in, you're in. Let me tell you something, guys. I speak from personal experience where I am not the same person I was 10, 15 years ago. And I love Him more than I did 10 minutes ago. Well, that may be a little... But I love Him more than I did... 10 days ago, I promise you. Because the more I spend time in here and the more I learn about Him, even when it's just a reminder of His grace and His mercy and how He forgave me and how He sent His Son to die for me and how His promise is that one day I will be able to eat from the tree of life in paradise with Him because of His gift, His salvation that He gave to me on the cross when He died. Because of that story, because of that historical account, guess what? I'm in love with Him even more. So are you. Are you in love with him? Well, I'm going to close with this thought. J.I. Packer said this. He said, many Westerners or Western evangelicals, let me say that again. Many Western evangelicals can smell unsound doctrine a mile away. And yet the fruit of personal experiences of God often proves rare among us. Let me say that again. Many Western evangelicals, that's us can smell unsound doctrine a mile away, and yet the fruit of personal experience of God often proves rare among us. This is not about feeling bad or guilty or like you should have done better. God does not bring about guilt to us. The Spirit brings about conviction, and that's just a way of saying, hey, that was probably shouldn't have done it that way, or you shouldn't do this if you're going to. It's not about being guilty. It's not about guilt. Christ died in your, for you. And your identity in Christ as a Christian is such that there is no guilt found upon you, no condemnation found upon you. When God looks upon you, He sees His Son, the beauty of Jesus Christ. And that is your salvation. But the conviction that comes in when you realize I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't do this is the Spirit's way of saying, don't walk away from God, walk with God. In other words, stop cheating yourself out of all the blessings you're missing by disobeying God and instead enjoy the many blessings He has for you, that life abundantly that John 10.10 says. Live in that life. Live in victory in Jesus. Walk in victory. I'll say this and I'll I'll dismiss. Listen. If you are walking around with the the mully grub, woe is me attitude, you are looking at the world, the enemy, something else, 
You're not looking in the mirror and seeing Jesus in you. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. You are awesome. You are so wonderfully made. And even though you had to deal with the fact that you were sinning and you needed Jesus to die for you, when God looks upon you and sees the beauty of His Son, He sees nothing but joy and celebration because you will inherit the kingdom of God. But here's your warning. If you look in the mirror... And there's no evidence in your life as you look. Not as I look, not as they look, but as you look. If you look in the mirror and there's no evidence of a spiritual change, you had better get with Jesus on that. Because if there is no change in you, and there is no salvation in you, there will not be paradise for you. Okay, that's important. That's the most important thing that we could ever talk about. And people say, well, how do I know I'm saved? Well, this is it. Do you believe? Yes, I do. Tell me about the difference that God has made in your life in the way you've been thinking since before you got saved to now. That's all I need to know. That's all. You want me to give you a reassurance of your salvation? Tell me where you had stinking thinking and where it changed after Jesus. Just tell me that. If you could tell me that story, because here's the thing, if you can't tell that story, we have a different conversation. We have one where, would you like to be sure that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you like to be sure that you're saved? But I stand here as God is my witness. If you walk down that path saying you're a Christian, but there's no difference even in your heart, in your mind, in the way you think and perceive things, you are being deceived with the greatest lie ever. And you can disagree with me all day long, but Paul made it clear that we were to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. If you're looking at the same you in the mirror that existed before Jesus, you better not play around with that because hell's a really serious mistake to make. That's a pretty serious punishment. And I would like to... Now, I'm not trying to scare you if you're a Christian. I'm not trying to scare you into coming down and getting saved all over again because it doesn't work that way. I'm not trying to scare you into coming down and thinking, my gosh, I'm a terrible human being. And God, you know, he, 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 I, I walked into church this morning knowing I was going to heaven. And I walked out wondering if I was going to go to hell. I'm not trying to make you scared. But I wouldn't be doing you justice if I didn't tell you the truth. Because I'm going to tell you, there's some preachers out there, God bless them. They're preaching a whole bunch of joy and goodness and grace and love and mercy. And hey, that's all awesome and it's in there. But there's people who think just because they hear that, they're going to go to heaven and they got a choice they got to make. you got a choice you got to make. Now, if you are a Christian, if you truly know you're going to heaven, you know when you die you're going to heaven. Because I, I know. I know Scripture tells That's my authority is Scripture, and I know based on Scripture that I'm dying, I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. I'm not scared. People will come up and say, well, that's kind of arrogant. No, no, I think it's pretty cool, actually. Well, I, you, you can't know that. Well, I can know what the Bible says, and that's what the Bible says. It can't take an argument any further than that. That's where my foundation comes from. So if you know that, but you look in the mirror tonight and you see a lazy, lackadaisical, poor excuse for an ambassador of Jesus, then the Bible says repent. In other words, say, this is not how I should live. I need to live on fire for you, Lord. If you go to work tomorrow and all day long Jesus never comes in your mind except when your coworker says his name in vain, You should spend some time with him on that. I tell people all the time, the only difference between me and you is that I get time to study every day. Whereas if you're working a full-time job, you may not have that opportunity every day like I do. That's it. And we could argue that there's time in the morning, time at night, time when you're doing other stuff that you probably shouldn't be doing. Or that you could replace it. But but that's that's between you and yours. The only difference between me and you is we walk through this path is that I hold the title of pastor. I have more responsibilities. I'm held to a higher accountability when it comes to God and man. But I would encourage you to look at it like this. If you wouldn't let your pastor get away with it, why are you getting away with it? I mean, it's only fair. I mean, am I wrong, anybody? I mean, I think that's fair. You're like, we don't care whether you think it's fair or not. We're hungry. Get us out of here. All right. Stand with me, please. Miss uh, Sydney, I know you're not feeling well. We're not going to do music with the organ today. Is that right? Are you able to play for an invitation, or would you rather not? Now, let's not do it. Let's not. I'll just uh, I'll hum. 